our next speaker is Dr. John Yaxley, and he is one of Australia's most experienced urology surgeons and one of the first in Queensland to use robotic surgery techniques for prostate cancer removal. Since this time, he's performed over 2,000 radical prostate prostatectomies, I think that's the right way of saying it, and including ro robotic use of robotic techniques. He's passionate about research and education and Dr. Yaxley has published over 40 papers and abstracts in medical journals. He's also involved in the academic teaching program of students at the Wesley Hospital and at the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital. And so we're fortunate to have your expertise with us tonight. Please come to the stage. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So you can see at Wesley, we, we have a really great urology team. I'm actually privileged to work at Wesley Hospital. The actual, the executive of Wesley have been fantastic for urologists. They put a lot of money and a lot of effort into making sure our program is the envy of the country and in the world, as you can see today. So we've, I'm just very privileged to work here. And we have a great research team, and we're lucky that the Wesley Medical Research are, are trying to help us as well. Um, I've done a lot of research. Um, I've done 16 papers this year, so 40 is a bit overdue. Uh, anyway, we do a lot of research yeah, at Wesley. I've done a lot too, and I've got really great colleagues that we work with. So I'm just going to touch through some of the things we do. I just want to touch through really the importance of research and what research does and how it changes not only how we treat our own patients, but how we treat patients throughout the country and how we treat patients throughout the world. And we can't do that without research. And I think you've heard about just how important Wesley have been in the development of MRI for in, in, basically for investigation of prostate cancer. Our visiting specialists from America only last year, it was the first time that they said they'd actually do an MRI of the prostate before they do a biopsy. They're about seven years behind in, in the States and nationally behind what we've been doing at Wesley Hospital and subsequently what we've been doing in Australia. And the reason that's important is in, in the old days, if you had a, a raised prostate blood test, you have a blood test and you think you're at risk of prostate cancer, everyone would get a prostate biopsy. They'd have this ultrasound scan shoved up their backside and all these needles rammed through the backside in their prostate. We like to protect our Queensland men from having an unnecessary procedure. <laughs> and this test that we did at Wesley Hospital, we showed that if you do the MRI and only biopsy what you find on the MRI, half of the men won't need a biopsy. And I can tell us the treasurer loves this because he has to spend less money on health. That's very important. And yeah. also, more importantly, we find more prostate cancer because there's just cancers we can't feel. And when you see where the cancer is on a scan, the urologist or the radiation or the radiologist knows where to stick the needle. They know where to find the cancer. And so we actually detect more cancer and we actually have to do less biopsies to find that. And so it has made a difference. Over here, um, in 2009, there was an unfortunate paper saying for, in the uh, New England Journal that we shouldn't be even doing prostate blood tests, and so that influenced things. The number of men having prostate blood tests dropped. But that stabilised, and then in 2012, you'll see when the MRI came in, we actually did less prostate biopsies as well, and less unnecessary radical prostatectomies, but we're still treating the men that need to be treated, we're not treating the men that don't need to be treated. We don't want to do no harm. A Hippocratic Oath first do no harm, and so in 2019, we're finding the cancers that need to be found, and we're not finding the cancers that won't kill men and then unnecessarily treating them. And we're not biopsying the people that don't have prostate cancer and giving them harm in an unnecessary biopsy. So that's helped. And Wesley, I can tell you, we're really the leaders in Australia and therefore the world. There was a publication in The Lancet three years after we did this publication that basically confirmed what we'd already found. Then the next thing is if you've got a prostate um, cancer that you, you suspect on an MRI, should you be doing that? biopsy in the MRI scanner, you know, fancy technology, should we send everyone down for an MRI? That's going to be expensive. And so we published a paper, we looked at what happens when you know where the lesion is, if you look at what you find on the MRI biopsy, and when you look at how we can biopsy with our normal techniques under an anaesthetic, in theatre, patients comfortable, no harm, and in fact there's no difference in the ability to diagnose prostate cancer once you know where it is. So our research showed us the most important thing is to do the MRI, it doesn't matter how you do the biopsy. So again, that's changing practice because of research, which without research may have taken us down another pathway. 
we do find some prostate cancers that will never kill people. All right? And when I say to Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, you've got a, a you know, low grade, low volume, non life threatening prostate cancer, what does Mr. Smith hear? He hears prostate cancer. And of course, he thinks, oh my God, I've got to treat this cancer. And if we treated that man, you know, we potentially could harm him for no benefit. So research has shown us, this was a randomised trial of men with these low-grade prostate cancer. We gave 550 men a radical prostatectomy, 550 men radiotherapy, and the other 550 men we didn't treat. All right? So what happened in that group? We found that they were all alive in 10 years. 98.8% of men were still alive, if they hadn't died of something else. So by giving that group of men surgery or radiotherapy, we're not benefiting them. We're potentially harming them, taking away their erectile function, perhaps taking away their continence. Right? So we know now, because of research, we feel confident. We, we think, gee, without research, are, we, are these men going to die? Are we going to miss the boat? Research have told us, no, it's OK not to treat these guys. All right? So that's about one quarter of the men we diagnose with prostate cancer now. The other three quarters of the men we have to treat because prostate cancer is more common than breast cancer and it kills more Australian men every year than women die of breast cancer. So we need to look after our males and we need to support them and treat them, but there's a group we know we don't have to treat at the start. Now, what other things have research done? This is the way I used to operate. The other surgeon is Sid Kenamasa, the most lovely man you'll ever met, the most fantastic surgeon, one of my mentors early on. Um, and I used to bend over for hours. I've still got a sore back. I've got to go to Pilates now to resuscitate my back from spending 25 years in a pelvis doing this. And we used to operate on men, do them a lot of good, but cause a lot of bleeding and you have to recover. I've got two big hands I've got to stick in someone's abdomen. So with this robotic surgery, um, can we make men's lives better with robotic surgery? And inside that paraphernalia in Wesley Hospital, it's fine spot the patient, all right? See if you can find him. So it's a lot of technology. Now, with this new technology came a lot of advertising, particularly in America. You know, surgery's so good, even your wife can feel the difference, you know? And if you have a robot, you're going to do better than if you have an open operation. And so there's a lot of marketing around this, and we had to say, well, what's the evidence that if you have robotic surgery, you're going to be doing better than having an operation done by an experienced open surgeon rather than an inexperienced robotic surgeon on a new machine? All right. So we, we actually did that research in Brisbane, but within five years of this technology coming to Queensland, 97% of private radical prostatectomies were done with a robot. It just took over. So we had to prove scientifically there was an advantage to new technology otherwise it's really inappropriate to do that right? and expensive so this was done at Royal Brisbane Hospital and the two Wesley urologists here myself and Jeff Coughlin were the two surgeons in this trial it's never been it's the only randomized trial ever published in the world of open versus robotic surgery published in the Lancet and what we found is that there's actually no difference in the main things you worry about which is can you cure somebody? Can you keep them from wetting their pants for the rest of their life? And if they're lucky, can they get some erections back after surgery? You know, men only think of two things when they wake up in the morning. One's what's for breakfast. But anyway, that's what we had to do. All right. So we proved it's your surgeon that's important. But we also proved with the robot, there is three times less blood loss. There's therefore less admissions to the intensive care unit or the post-operative high, high dependency unit. You get a hospital earlier there's less, much less pain. There's better physical quality of life for the first six weeks and better emotional quality of life for the first three months. There's win, 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 win in all the minimally invasive treatments. So yes, robot trumps open prostatectomy with all the minimally invasive advantages that's, that men want, but you've still got to pick a good surgeon. And the last thing, and Nick showed you, in here, this is a man with prostate cancer on a CT. You can't see that anywhere. All right? But if you look over here, there's the prostate cancer and here's the lymph node metastasis. This is called PET-PSMA scan. So Wesley, again, invested in this. The first hospital in Australia to do this. We do more PET-PSMA scans than any unit in Australia. And, um, and we're one of the world's best centres with this technology. So much so that um, this is a trial It will be published at the end of this month in the British Journal of Urology International. And we've actually um, won article of a month for the British Journal of Urology. 
in the world, there was a thing called a meta-analysis mm -hmm. where you get all the studies done together and you put all the, paper, all the patients together and you, and you form a paper. It's called a meta-analysis. And in that group, looking at men who were staged when they were first diagnosed, there was only 741 men in all the world's publication. And at Wesley Hospital, we're publishing 1,253 men. We've done more, nearly double the whole world's publication literature. So again, we're proud and privileged to be at a centre that really supports urology research. So the final thing what I want to quickly brief, brief on today so we can go back and have some drinks. The current trial we're looking at is once you've had a radical prostatectomy, you've had your surgery, men have to be discharged with a catheter in their penis for a week to let the anastomosis heal. And in the old days, we'd keep men on antibiotics because we'd worried they'd get a urinary tract infection, which can lead to septicemia and a hospital admission. We also worry about the fact that we can develop superbugs by leaving a catheter in and keeping people on antibiotics. Now, I'm not talking about this superbug, I'm talking about the superbugs, all right? <laughs> so um, with superbugs, by giving antibiotics, we can develop multi-resistant strains of bacteria. We can develop bad bacteria by giving people antibiotics they don't need. So what we want to do, we want to give antibiotics to people who need it, but again, we don't want to harm people that don't need it. All right? And so in, in, the, in the community now, 10% of men have what we call ciprofloxacin resistant bacteria. They're nasty bugs. But in hospital, it's 26%. So hospitals are full of bugs that have already started to mutate and become terrible. So that's why we try and get people out of hospital quicker which why robotic surgery, they go out of hospital the next day versus five days with an open operation based on Australian data. So this is what happens to antibiotics that are produced. They don't come to humans. Where do all the antibiotics go to? They go to livestock, all right? You're getting those livestock fattened and, and you want to get them, get, get them out of that, that farm and, and sold in the community to make money. It's a profitable thing. But we eat those antibiotics that are in the livestock and we're eating the multi-resistant bacteria. So we're trying to decrease the development of resistant strains in the body because then we don't have any, back, any antibiotics to basically protect ourselves from getting infected with that bacteria. And so if you travel to some centres in the world, particularly Asia, before you leave you don't have many bad bugs. But when you come back, even though you're feeling okay, a third of people have these multi-resistant bacteria in, this, in their rectum. So this is bad. So what we're doing now is everybody that has a radical prostatectomy, when we take the catheter out, we normally give them a dose of antibiotics as, at the time of taking the catheter out. So have one dose of antibiotics in theatre and then one dose when we take the catheter out. And we've gone away from giving them the antibiotics for the whole time. So we're already decreasing the amount of antibiotics we give. But we, we don't know whether we have to give that second antibiotic when we take the catheter out. So this is a trial of all men coming into this hospital to have their catheter removed. One group of men will have an antibiotic at catheter removal, and the other group of men will have an injection that's not an antibiotic. It's, it's actually saline or water. Now, the surgeons won't know what antibiotic they're getting. The patients won't know what antibiotic they're getting, and neither will the GP. The only one that will know is the person giving it, which is our research fellow. And then every week for four weeks, our men will give a urine sample. And we'll check what happens to their urine every week for a month. So what may happen is they might get an infection and come back to hospital. They'll get treated, and then we'll know what the urine result shows. It may happen they get symptoms and go to their GP and the GP's worried about it. We'll tell the GP if they've got an infection or not. That's okay. We want to keep pe people treated properly. But what we might find is that man's got bacteria and over four weeks it just goes away by itself. All right. So what we want to know is can we safely avoid more antibiotics in people that may not need it? Or it might be actually there's so many infections in the group of men that don't get antibiotics that we should be saying to our, our, our health fund and our Medicare and our health providers that we have to give men antibiotics because their management or their treatment of care is not proper or it's not uh, high quality if we don't give that. And at the moment, the health funds don't fund Wesley Hospital for bringing them in to give them those antibiotics. And so men are paying out of money expenses that they either might not need or that the health funds should, should be providing because they need it. And that, this trial will be very important, not only to Australia, but throughout the world. This is, there's, a hundred, there's hundreds of thousands of radical prostatectomies done throughout the world every year. So this is a trial which can benefit not just Brisbane men or Queensland Australia, but it can benefit men throughout the world. So I think it's a very important study. 
So I'm sorry to take up so much time, and I do thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.